Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to talk about oscillations and how those work as things can oscillate back and forth. So a little some of our work here will involve talking about things like springs. And let's go ahead and look at some of this and go ahead and get started. And an object oscillating must be experiencing a force. So if we look back, we have to understand that anything that is oscillating going back and forth is not undergoing uniform straight line motion. And that is the requirement from Newton's laws for things to be undergoing a force. Remember that an object at rest remains at rest and an object in motion remains in motion. And that is uniform straight line motion. And if something is oscillating, then it is going back and forth and therefore is changing its direction and must be accelerating and therefore there must be a force. And that is caused by the deformation in this case of our image here of the ruler, which causes a force in the opposite direction. And we call this a restoring force. Now that force is given by F for the force is equal to negative K times X the displacement and the minus sign tells us that the force is always opposite to the displacement. So if the displacement is to the right, the force is a restoring force pulling it back to the left. If the displacement is to the left, then the restoring force is pulling it to the right. So X is the displacement from the equilibrium, which would be the central position there. And K is the force constant, which depends on how stiff the object is. A stiffer object could have a larger force constant and a, a less stiff object would have a very small force constant. Now we can go ahead and look at an example of this to try to understand it better. And let's look at a suspension system in a car. So we can have that a car could settle 1.2 centimeters if an 80 kilogram person gets in it. So the springs are very stiff. It's only settling a couple of centimeters. And, and let's go ahead and look at what we know. And we have that the displacement is equal to 0.12 centimeters. Remember, we have to get that into meters. So it will be negative 0.01 two meters. So we want to get that into meters. And the mass is equal to 80 kilograms. So those are our known values. And we can look at figure out first, we need to figure out the amount of force involved. So the force is equal to the weight or the mass times the gravitational force. Now the mass of the person was 80 kilograms. Gravitational force is 9.8 meters per second squared. So if we put those together, we find that the force is 784 newtons. So now we know the force and the displacement, so we can go ahead and calculate the force constant. So if you recall, the force is given by uh, negative k times x. And if we want to solve for k, k is equal to negative f over x. So we calculate the force, which we had here. And we're going to divide that by the displacement, which we were given. And that will allow us to determine the force constant. So we put those numbers in, and that will be negative 784 newtons divided by negative 0.012 meters. And if we divide those, we have two negatives there. So they uh, cancel out and become a positive. And the force constant, the restoring force, would be 6.53 times 10 to the fourth Newton per meter. So that is one example of what we've looked at. And we can also consider potential energy. There is also an elastic potential energy that occurs because work has to be is done to produce that deformation. And that work is then stored as potential energy, just as we can have gravitational potential energy. We can have potential energy when in a spring when it is compressed or stretched. And that potential energy is given by one half k x squared. So that would allow us then to calculate a potential energy here. We can go ahead and do an example of this. And here's the example. We're looking for the amount of energy stored in the spring of a tra tranquilizer gun that has a force constant of 50 newtons per meter.
We are, as usual, neglecting friction, and the mass and the mass of the spring to calculate the speed with which a two gram projectile will be ejected. So let's go ahead and write what we know here. And what we know is the force constant. We know the displacement and we know the mass. And remember, we've got to convert it to SI units. So two grams is 0 0.002 kilograms. And then we know now we know of everything we need to figure out the potential energy because we know the displacement, which is here, and we know the force constant. And that potential energy is given by one half uh, k here times x squared. And remember, it does not depend on the mass of the projectile. The projectile is not yet involved. It is only the potential energy stored in the spring. And the, the projectile is not involved in that. So we find, if we multiply that out, that the elastic potential energy is 0.563 Newton meters. So that's the first part of this. Now we want to find the speed at which the projectile will be ejected. Well that we are going to convert that potential energy of the spring into kinetic energy. So we have potential energy here. When the spring expands back to its rest state, then that has to be converted to kinetic energy. And we're ignoring things like friction and air resistance. So it will then go out with exactly the same energy. So the potential energy elastic is the same as the kinetic energy. Those two energies are the same. And we know that kinetic energy is given by 1 half m, which is the mass of the projectile, times its velocity squared. And of course, the velocity is what we are looking for. So we can go ahead and solve that. If we put the numbers in there, we can solve this equation here for uh, the velocity, which would be the square root of 2 times the elastic potential energy divided by the mass. Now we know that the elastic potential energy was given here. And the mass, of course, was one of our givens in the problem. We can put those in. And when we calculate that, we find that the velocity will be 23.7 meters per second. So that's another example that we've looked at. And the last topic that we want to look at in this lecture is the idea of periodic motion. So periodic motion is, as you might expect, a periodic motion that repeats itself. So things moving periodically will go back and forth. So an object dangling from a spring could bounce up and down. And if you could ignore resistance in the spring, and if you could ignore air resistance, then it would continue like that. Now when we have periodic motion, we can have an oscillation and the time to complete one oscillation is called the period and that is represented by capital T. We also have a frequency. The frequency is the number of oscillations per unit time, generally how many oscillations per second. And that would be our SI unit, which is the Hertz. And one Hertz is one cycle per second. So if it repeats once per second, it has a frequency of one Hertz. The frequency and the period are related inversely so that the frequency is one divided by the period. Now we can look at an example to do this a little bit. And we could have, for example, an ultrasound that is oscillating with a period of 0.4 microseconds. And we want to find the frequency. And then the second part after we're done with this, if the frequency is of middle C is 264 hertz, what is the time to complete one oscillation? So we're going to work the first problem here. And we're given the time, which is 0.4 microseconds, or 0.4 times 10 to the negative 6 seconds. The frequency is then equal to 1 divided by the period. So 1 divided by 0.4 times 10 to the negative 6. And if we calculate that, we find that that would be 2.5 times 10 to the 6th hertz. And that's often mil that's millions of hertz. And those are called megahertz. So 2.5 megahertz would be the answer that we would get. That would be the frequency of this oscillation that occurs in the ultrasound. 
Now we can also do the problem backwards, which is what we're looking for when we give middle C, we give the frequency in Hertz 264 Hertz. And now we are looking for the period, what is the time to complete one oscillation. And again, we know that frequency is equal to one over the period. And we can invert those and say that the period is equal to one over the frequency, which is what we're going to need here. So we can go ahead and put our numbers in here. We have 1 over 264 hertz or 1 over 264 cycles per second from the definition of a hertz. If we divide that, we get 3.79 times 10 to the negative third seconds or 3.79 milliseconds for the period for middle C. So we've done a couple of examples here showing some of the different things that we can do with the oscillations. And let's go ahead and finish up this section with our summary. And what we've covered today, we talked about oscillations, and they result from a restoring force that works opposite to the deformation. So if it's de if the object is deformed in one direction, the force pulls it in the opposite direction to restore it to its original position. We talked about the force constant, which measures how stiff a spring is. And we talked last about the period and frequency of an oscillation and how they are inversely related. So that concludes this lecture on oscillations. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.